Welcome back. Listen, well, before we close out this subject of uh, a fantastic series The Times did that many of you followed, you've been barred with a lot of information, um, a lot of disclaimers, uh, debates on this, but one number that uh, I just want you to process is 5,100. That's the number of inmates. 5,100 inmates have escaped from New Jersey's privately run halfway houses since 2005. Again, that's according to the Times, and that includes at least 1,300 escapees in the 29 months that Governor Christie took office. I bring Andrew back in. Now, there's a debate that maybe a few were a few hours late back, but we're talking thousands of people. Um, and if you said thousands of people are walking out of prisons, yeah. you'd have a cause celeb going on in the state here that this is a security issue. But a halfway house is a different connotation until you look at some of the people and what they did when they got out, the innocent civilians. Um, it's just, listen, I understand everybody's got to do their job and everybody's got to put their own spin on things, but when you process all the information, the one thing that I took away from was, what is the incentive for all these people? And when you read the Time series, and we've linked it to our site here, um, for all these people of all different walks of life, former inmates, former guards here, people who work there, people who resigned out of frustration or protest, there's the same story that this is an out-of-control system with minimal oversight here, and it's being driven by the almighty buck. Well, and it's, it, look, I can see there being some incentives for former employees to, to maybe uh, be a little uh, specious with the truth, but why would an ex-con come back and say, you know what, the conditions that I, in the place where I was and I'm no longer at were so terrible that I feared for my life? That adds a lot of credence to the story for me. It, look, these halfway houses weren't designed for this initially, uh, and they've been expanded in their use as becoming sort of a secondary jail. The problem is that they're lower staffed in their operations on the cheap because they're private industry as opposed to the state. Uh, you know, the, a governor's well, head, a a governor's second, head would roll if there were conditions Because people hear privatization, like we hear this even on the national landscape and in the run for presidency, and everyone says, oh great, government bad here, inefficient, private companies do it better. But when you're making cents on a dollar, and, and states and cities got to cut back, they say, you take it over. Mm -hmm. And if your incentive is not as a not-profit, which is how they were set up, but instead for-profit, you're going to cut corners wherever you can. And when you have one guard, one woman watching 100 inmates without anything to really defend herself here, you are asking for a tremendous amount of trouble. And here. this is why the politicians keep doing it. it. It lowers their jail costs. In Essex County, and we've got uh, the, the, the executive DiVincenzo on the bottom right there, they send their inmates to the halfway house, which costs them about half as much as it does holding them in their own prison. Then they fill their open beds in their prisons with federal prisoners and get full price from Washington for it. So they're actually making a profit or helping e eat into their budget deficits. And you mentioned um, the county executive, Andrew, and I just wanted to read a quote here. In, in he was very blatant, uh, Mr. DiVincenzo, and he's not alone in this, okay? I'm not trying to make him the one guy, but this is in his district. He was very blatant about why he's an advocate of this private system. And this is his quote verbatim. I had to go out there and find new ways, he said, innovative ways to be able to bring in dollars. One of the ways we've been able to do that to keep the taxes low is bringing in things like this. My chief responsibility is to bring in revenue for this county, and we've done it very very well. I'm sorry, your chief responsibility is to keep your people safe and to keep facilities in your, in your way something that is not going to get us to a point where we say, what is going on in America? To me, I think there's been a mission creep here or a confusion that I, that I find really, really unfortunate. Um, this story is already, Andrew, um, starting to make some people sit up and take notice. The governor said, even though with his ties to this, that he's going to have a, a full review. And the assembly and the legislature, they're saying some of the same things. Well, both, uh, both the uh, democratically controlled Senate and the assembly are sort of drooling at the prospects of holding uh, hearings on this. Senate Senator Barbara Buono saying uh, they should be protecting the public, these centers not turning a profit for politically connected companies. Yes. Uh, that may wrap up the entire problem all in one sentence. And the controller we learned a couple of years ago said that as a state, they've done a poor job of monitoring the program, made no real attempt to find out what taxpayers are getting for their money, and he's doubling down now. Trust me, this story is going to have legs, and we're going to be all over it. I want to remind you folks at home here before we move on to our next topic, go to our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Live. 
A, we want you to sound off. It's your platform to make your opinions heard here. Should halfway houses be privatized? And also, you can see our full interviews on the topic, both me with Dr. Mackey and Andrew with the New York Times reporter who filed this piece, and you can see their complete coverage as well. We'll link their stories there in the video that you saw.